Keep in mind this, uh, Dan also totaled 2071. So this is at the end of a long day. And then I went straight to a thousand. Originally I was gonna do a smaller jump, but I was like, I, I, I wanna, I don't wanna conserve energy. I just wanna go for it. What yeah, kind of awesome. weights did you get in training uh, to end up with a thousand twenty-five? Like what was the last maybe three, four weeks of your training look like? Kind of get used to opening up. Mm -hmm. I use the hip circle. No, no shame on the plug there. I've been using the hip cir circle for years. You know what I'm saying? Like if you wear shoes that aren't meant for actual feet, the muscle in your feet start getting weaker and weaker. All right, stupid deadlift questions. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've seen with other people, when you try to go for these these crazy goals, and they're, they're not out of reach, but when you try to like go for them too soon, it kind of doesn't ever work out that way. Most people, their thumbs can't handle it. So I'm curious, how did you build up your ability to hook grip? I went from my first meet in 2014, I pulled 600. Six months later, I pulled 700. I've learned to put less and less emphasis on breaking it off the floor. But that being said, anything under 850, like if I'm not careful, it'll just start, it'll start floating. And one time, one time I tweaked my back with like 600 pounds because I went to like spread the floor and it already came halfway up my shins and it kind of like tweaked my lower back. I was like, mm -hmm. did I really just tweak my back? Power Project family, how's it going? Today we have an amazing guest for you guys. We have Danny Grigsby. This man just broke the all-time deadlift record at 1,025 pounds raw last week. It's fucking amazing. But he talks to us about his deadlift technique, how he prepared for this meet, different ideas for hook gripping, his powerlifting progression, and his work as a Marine. So you guys don't want to miss this episode. And I want to add something in. Danny hit this record in a pair of in vivos we've been wearing these shoes for over almost a year now and um if you're a lifter you want to get your hands on these shoes they're fucking amazing but how do you get them andrew they can get them at vivobarefoot.com and at checkout make sure you guys use promo code power project to save 20 percent off your entire order uh links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes i hope you guys enjoy this episode yeah, so we're talking about some big time deadlift and we had somebody big time yeah big time somebody <laughs> recently uh, just a couple of days ago, beat the all-time deadlift record, and we're going to have him on the show today, mm -hmm. Dan Grigsby. He yeah. did a 1,025 deadlift, somebody that served our country uh, as a Marine, so we can ask him some good questions about all that stuff. But this 1,025 deadlift kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, this guy is really strong. I've seen him pull over 900 pounds before uh, on his Instagram, but I don't really know. Like With some of the people that are in the hunt for these big, big-ass deadlifts, uh, I don't really know if he was like the front runner to be able to hit the all time biggest powerlifting deadlift, uh, meaning it was done in a powerlifting competition. Previously, Benedict Magnuson did 1,015, mm -hmm. which I believe was like in an exhibition. But you got to tilt your hat to all these guys that have lifted these weights. Hab Thor Bjornsson, who's done over 1,100 pounds, Eddie Hall, who's done over 1,100 pounds. Those are in strongman where the rules are different. And sometimes these athletes will wear uh, deadlift suits, which they do help. Some people are like, they don't do anything. Well, if they didn't do anything, mm -hmm. people wouldn't wear them. They help. And uh, they just have different rules in, in strongman. They're allowed to wear straps as well. So this is 1,025 deadlift. Now, it was done sumo, so the internet erupted because automatically cheating. it's cheating. And Seema knows that yeah. firsthand because he loves to cheat on the deadlift mm -hmm. as well. All the time. And, uh, you know, the range of motion is changed, but then there was a lot of questions, and this is what I'd like to address. There's a lot of questions about height. You know, people like, he didn't move the bar very far, and in comparison to, to Thor and, and to Eddie Hall, those guys are moving such a greater distance. Now, distance is a huge factor in the overall, like, scheme of things, in the overall volume, and in the work that you put in uh, for that particular movement. However... Taller athletes a lot of times have a big advantage on deadlift. The all-time biggest deadlift for a long time was like 925 pounds. It was held by a guy named Gary Heisey who did that deadlift like late 80s, maybe early 90s and had the record for years. Um, Gary Heisey was six foot eight. So a lot of these athletes are usually actually a lot taller than what you'd think. Six foot eight? Hap Thorby Orenson is six foot nine. Um, uh Brian Shaw is six foot eight. I mean, a lot of these guys are tall and being tall, you know, you can kind of think, okay, well, a taller person a lot of times is going to have longer arms and a lot of times they're going to have uh, longer, larger uh, hands to be able to grab onto the bar and to be able to make the lift a little bit easier. So when it comes to conventional deadlifting, 
in my opinion, uh, uh, it's not harder for a taller athlete. The only time it can be more difficult for a taller athlete is if they're mainly like all torso. Like if they have like a really long uh, torso, sometimes yeah. that can be kind of hard. But again, usually a taller athlete actually has a pretty good advantage when it comes to conventional deadlifting. And he's ready to go if you guys want to awesome. have him on. Awesome. Yeah. Gravy. Gravy. Don't you know we say Groovy. I did just say groovy. Did you not hear me? I thought you said gravy. Oh, oh look at that. He just gravy. bounced. I said I said groovy. He bounced that out? Yeah. I'll, I'll just tell him to come back in. Man, you're getting old. You just can't hear anymore. You can you can tell him to maybe wait a couple minutes. That would be cool. Okay. We well, can still chit chat. Yeah. Okay. I, what did, you got? I did say gravy, Andrew. What okay. you got over there? <laughs> no, no. I was just... <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to fuck with you in your old age. Um, no, you're not old. You are a young man and you're getting younger year by year. I don't want to implant any type of shit in your mind or Thank anybody's you, mind. Let's get to this. Um, yeah, I was looking over some of uh, just some of the lifts that he was doing. And it was really interesting. You were saying before the podcast, like um, it, there was it, it's kind of wild that he pulled 1025 because there didn't seem to be an indicator. And it's going to be really interesting to see what his training looked like leading up to it like what was he touching did he expect to be able to move something like this because when you watch the video of the 1025 the first thing you noticed and obviously 1025 crazy to say <laughs> it's crazy to fucking say but the first thing you notice is how much slack he's able to pull out of that yeah because I, I was watching him work with like nines and eights and he was using a different bar that didn't allow you to pull as much slack out mm. but with that 1025 that bar one whoop, and then and the plates moved before yeah. he even started, really, it looked like. Yep, he was able to really pull a crazy amount of slack out of the bar. And it makes you wonder, like, he's ridiculously strong. But that Kabuki PR deadlift bar, uh, I, I know, like, it's, it's US. It did 95% of the work It for did him. all the work. Yeah, he lifted 125. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was nothing. No, but I, I'm really, I really am curious because do other people within that federation are they all able to use the same bar to pull those records or are some people using a texas deadlift bar and then in some meets the kabuki bar is there because i mean as you've mentioned the kabuki bar is different mm. like there is a difference between that a texas deadlift bar and a stiff bar it makes it big i mean it sounds silly but the equipment that we have at power thing meets makes a big difference and normally at a power thing meet it's not really that big of a hindrance because usually you have kind of like in certain federations, you have a particular bar for squats. So the bar doesn't bend and have a lot of whip to it. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, bent, you have bars for bench pressing that again, they don't have much whip to it. And then the last thing is the deadlift bar. And the deadlift bar a lot of times is uh, going to be thinner. Yeah, It has more knurling on it, like a Texas deadlift bar. That was an evolution in the sport years and years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we have a new style of bar that's allowing people to lift even more. And the comparison I heard being made was it's like comparing a regular stiff bar uh, to a deadlift bar. So this bar is, you know, one-upping the Texas deadlift bar by who knows how much weight hard to say and i'm i want to also like say like the kabuki bar i was i was talking to jamal yesterday jamal browner he pulled a thousand three for like a double he's also like him i think he's on like 1100 in training with straps or something right Jam jamal's pulling some crazy shit like he's, he's part of this conversation as far as amazing deadlifters right and he's strong overall 250 pounds or something like that right yeah, it's he's, ridiculous he's a monster um but he was mentioning how that bar also has a lot of knurling, like even extra knurling. Mm. And though both these guys, Jamal and Danny, they both pull hook grip, which is fucking, their thumbs are made of steel. Um, but I also, I mean, literally, when we're talking about this, or when I'm talking about this at least, I'm not taking anything away from that record or that pull. But if, you, if, we're, if we're having a conversation about like the these records, it does make me wonder, shouldn't there, if, if, if a record is broken with a bar, Shouldn't that be standard across the board for all of the meets within a federation so all of these lifters have the opportunity to pull on the same bar and br and potentially break this ridiculous record that was just set? It's amazing. Context matters. But I mean, you know, one of the goats in MMA is Hoist Gracie. Uh, unfortunately, the athletes don't have the opportunity to display the same guts and determination that Hoist Gracie did because Hoist Gracie went through three individuals to to win his UFC championships and they don't they don't have a tournament like that anymore they mm. kind of just deemed it unsafe the athletic commissions won't allow it and therefore you don't have it anymore and so sometimes you know you are trying to compare athletes or compare people to each other 
uh, compare people to the legendary Ed Cohn, but then, you know, certain types of powerlifting equipment came along, rules changed, maybe people don't squat as low, and yada, 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 and then we end up with people commenting, you know, a ton about this particular deadlift versus Thor's deadlift and versus all these other deadlifts. One thing I would say that is something that you can really observe is A, how far the plates move, and B, if you really care about this shit, <laughs> I don't think anyone should really care that much because these, <laughs> these are fucking like record lifts and they're unbelievable, like regardless, right? This so the, true. the plates didn't move very far because the, the bar bends so much and mm -hmm. because of the style of deadlift that he utilized. The other thing I'm looking at is where the guy's elbow is. Where this, uh, where Dan's elbow is in relation to like his belt, his, his elbow joint is like in line with his belt. Now, if you look at Eddie Hall and if you look at Hapthor Bjornsson, uh, their elbows are way above because they have to like pick the weight up X amount higher. So is it more impressive, less impressive? I don't think it's more or less impressive. It's just that you can make an argument. Look, man, they, they do have to pull the weight further. So That's go true. a larger distance. That's true. As, as far as the 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 fight on type of deadlift. Hey, I'm all for Danny Pool and Sumo. Danny, you're the greatest, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah, let me pull it up really quick. And he's he's ready to go now. Cool. But Hi, guys. And welcome back to... I love lifting angle. vault, by the way. Uh -huh. I want to talk about one of the longest... I definitely don't want to get... Yeah. Oof. This man is meaty. 948 deadlift. He just... That just smoked it. Looked so ridiculous. That's what's interesting about this, too. And... We saw this years ago with, uh, is it Believ? He was just really smashing those deadlifts where he's in this crazy upright posture. So I didn't even realize this. I didn't realize he hit, you know, that big deadlift. Now he's hitting 1,003. Posture doesn't break. Like his torso doesn't That was down. so easy. He just did 1,003 so easy. And his coach isn't joking. He does have more in the tank. Uh, by the way, I think the 1,003 is the biggest sumo deadlift in the history of power. I think it's his first deadlift over 1,000 pounds sumo in competition. I could be wrong. Jeez. Oh, Keep in mind this, uh, Dan also totaled 2071. So this is at the end of a long day after he already pulled 1,000 pounds and then he just fucking rips up 1,000. It's just, I don't, I don't understand. How about the, so uh, the performance enhancing shoes though? Oh, yeah, dude. He's he did it in Vivos. He did it in Vivo barefoot shoes. Hey. Yeah, he's got those fancy red socks. And look at that singlet, too. That's a slingshot singlet, a strong singlet from markbellslingshot.com, mm. which will make you brutally fucking strong. We <laughs> yeah, already know like, that. It'll yeah. add like 70 pounds to your deadline. Yeah, I 70 do, to like 150 beautiful. pounds. I do find it how really cool, though, how like he... Honestly, he just came out of nowhere and did this shit. <laughs> it's like, who's this lifter that just deadlifted 1,025? He's got like, it's fucking came wild. Out of nowhere. Hey, yo. I love the office. Yeah. What's going on, yeah. my man? Not much, Mark. I, uh, I just checked out of my hotel, so this was the best uh, available spot I could find. Are you sore at all, or you feel good? I actually feel pretty good. Day after the meet, obviously, you're a little stiff, but... Normally for a few days, I'm just not doing much. I just try to walk and get the body flowing. But yeah, I'm feeling I'm feeling pretty good. Pretty happy with that. How does it feel to hit an all time world record? I mean, that's the biggest deadlift in the history of powerlifting. How do you feel about that? Uh, hey, I mean, going into this meet, my goal was just to pull a thousand because at the showdown, I came really close and felt I just sat back too far and lost my balance because of those weights. I mean, you're packing your lats and stuff, but the compression in your spine and in your <laughs> shoulders, it's hard to tell sometimes if you're locking it out because, like, Shit. you know, it's just literally just pulling you down. But this time I made sure I didn't sit back that far, and it felt great. I opened, I opened with 948, and then, and then I went straight to 1,000. Originally I was going to do a smaller jump, but I was like, I, 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 wanna, I don't want to conserve energy. I just want to go for it. And... uh also at the meet, they had the Kabuki deadlift bar, like the new, the newer one. And I didn't know that till the day before at weigh-in. So I had been training on a Texas bar. Like, I mean, there's very few people who have a Kabuki right now. But it was interesting. I got to warm up with one, and I could tell the whip. People talk about the whip, and obviously the whip is very substantial. It's definitely, it's a, it's a notch or two above what a Texas deadlift bar is. Wow. And the knurling is just, knurling is like a cheese grater, but in a good way, like it. I mean, you're not dropping 
if you do hook grip or even if you have good grip in general, you're not you're not gonna drop drop a weight with this bar. The knurling's that good. So what yeah, kind of awesome. weights did you get in training uh to end up with a thousand twenty five? Like what was the last maybe three, four weeks of your training look like? So um I'm trying to think my heaviest double during training was nine forty, nine forty two. I'm bad with kilos, so as long as it's within mm-hmm. five kilos, I know I know I did my job because that's just too overwhelming for me because I suck at math. But my last heavy pull was nine fifty nine, and I I had went for nine eighty three like six weeks out and I failed it. That day I was just off, and I've been having trouble with my hips being kind of uneven and crooked. And during sumo, that's like a nightmare if your hips don't feel even and centered. So my heaviest pull all prep was nine fifty nine, and I did. But that's normally, as weird as it sounds, normally I get 40 or 50 pounds more on the platform than I ever do in training. And I think I account that for, um, I mean, call it fight or flight, adrenaline, whatever the proper term for it is. But at a meet, I'm very dialed in. Like in training, I'm not saying I don't take training seriously, but it's hard to replicate a meet environment in training. Like no matter how hard you try, you can have 100 people in front of you when you're training. But when you go to an actual meet, it's kind of like this, like, switch turns on. I just feel very focused and very just, there's no doubt in my mind. And even if I had a shitty prep, once I go to a meet, it's like, at that point, you're not thinking anymore. You just go on the platform, and it's just like you do what your body's ingrained to do, you know. Man, I'm really curious about this because, okay, so you were, you know, you, usually before meet, you say 40 to 50 pounds more is what you expect, but you got 75 pounds more than what you hit in training. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really curious. Oh, go ahead, real quick. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to make it sound like it'll be there on meet day, but through years, my last few meets, that's kind of consistently what's happened. Mm-hmm. So I know it's like a ballpark of what I expect. Like I said, at the showdown, I did 970. My heaviest pull in training then was 950. So like I said, every meet's different, but throughout the years, that's normally. Now it's not the same with squat or bench. Mm-hmm. I wish it was. <laughs> like squat, I normally get. 10 to 20 pounds more on meat day bench around the same, mm-hmm. but I think deadlift just cause it's so, it's so taxing on your CNS. Like I don't believe in fully like whatever you get in a meet, I don't, whatever your goal is in a meet, I don't believe in doing that in training yeah. just cause of the, the stress that plays on your CNS. Just proves that sumo is cheating. But what I was going to really ask yeah. you, <laughs> <laughs> fuck with you. I love sumo. Yeah. Um, but what yeah. I was going to ask you, man, is when you were backstage, you've never trained with the Kabuki deadlift bar. And, you know, we were, Mark was talking about the comparison, like the, a, a normal stiff bar to a Texas deadlift bar is like the difference between a Texas and a Kabuki. It has so much more um, slack that you can pull out. So I'm like, do you, what kind of difference do you think that made? Do you think it made a substantial difference even though it was the first time you were working with that bar on that day. Um, how do you feel about that? Cause a lot of people are talking about that as far as the deadlift is concerned. Yeah. So I, as weird as that sounds, it's like, like you just said, the difference between a Texas Kabuki is like a stiff to a Texas because it's <laughs> now I can't give a number or like a percentage of how much more flexion, but it's enough where I felt like I wasn't exerting as much effort. Like I literally, like when I pulled nine sixty compared to when I pulled a thousand, it it took less effort to break a ground with a thousand than it did with nine sixty on a kabuki bar. Mm. So but but the caveat of that is so in as long as you know how to brace and, and create mm. tension into the bar, whether you're conventional or sumo, it'll be easier off the ground, but you can't lock your knees out too fast because people were talking about <laughs> the excess whip and all my attempts. And that's why I held it for two to three seconds. And even after that point, you could still see the bar kind of like it, <laughs> Is there's no way around it. Even when I was warming up with 600, 700, 800, it was doing the same thing. And I was trying to, I was lifting the weight as slow as possible, you know, to make it not, but it was still bouncing up and down. Even once you locked out mm. and you're completely motionless. So it's definitely a different beast. And I can understand how people have mixed feelings because obviously you're probably, I don't know how long a Texas devil part around 30, 40 years, however long it's been, that's been the standard and that's what everyone's lifted on. So now that, there's this new bar in town and it's obviously different. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you and say it it doesn't help. It definitely does help. If you know how to use it, like Mm. I said, you kind of have to be more conservative off the floor and just not too fast at lockout. Cause any sort of excess of like whip or movement, that's going to translate into the bar. It's going to feel like you have an earthquake bar, even though it's a deadlift bar, you know? 
Can you describe uh, this like whip and bend of the bar for people that maybe have no idea what we're talking about? And then also maybe like how you kind of wedge yourself into the bar and, and create all that tension before you start the lift? Yeah, definitely. So when I say whip, it's kind of just like, so if you were to just lift the bar off the ground without bracing and without wedging, it's literally going to feel like there's like a, you're going to, you're going to meet a point where it's just going to pull you down because kind of like the same with the Texas bar. When they say pull up the slack, that's to ensure that that extra whip doesn't stop your uh, forward momentum as you pull. And what was the second part of that question? So the bar, the bar is basically bending, right? And so you can make an argument that maybe this Kabuki bar bends like a little bit more and because it bends a little bit more, it probably allows you to get in slightly better position uh, as you're starting to pull. So, like, what are some techniques you utilize in training to, like, I guess, get yourself into that amazing position? Because you're just, you're completely straight up and down when you're doing the lift. And it almost like, I mean, of course, your lower back is being utilized, but it almost doesn't even look like it. Yeah, so that was actually, this is kind of off subject for a sec, but it'll kind of explain it. So I did conventional my first few years and I only tried out sumo because I was getting lower back pain. And at the time I didn't realize I wasn't bracing properly and I was letting my back sag too much, but it worked out because obviously I realized very quickly I did sports like track and field, football, basketball, and baseball. So I did a lot of running and stuff as a kid and I did a lot of mobility drills to get my groin and hip flexors really healthy and strong. Mm. So then when I started sumo, I already had a pretty good range of mobility and from the beginning, I went really wide. So I do some static stretches for my hips. I like doing hip airplanes to kind of open up the hips and kind of get that, uh, kind of get used to opening up. Mm-hmm. I use the hip circle. No, no shame on the plug there. I've been using the hip cir- circle for years. I like it just it just primes my glutes because especially because I pull so wide. If your glutes aren't firing, that's a huge part. Like I feel like my back is locked into place, but obviously my quads my quads and my glutes are the main movers. Like if my glutes aren't firing at lockout, I'm not going to be able to, to be able to bring my hips through like I do. Mm. So glutes is, glutes is a big deal. And I'll do all sorts of little things with the, with the uh, hip circle. Like I'll do glute kickbacks. I'll do kind of glute mm. side. I don't know what you call them. Like where you just bring your leg to your side. There's just so many different things you can use with the hip circle. So that's why I like it. Cause it's a very like versatile little band or tool or whatever you want to call it. But when I, when I pull, how I think about getting into position is first, I kind of, I learned it kind of from Dan Green, how he used to kind of like, you do that thing where he'd bring his arms up and kind of tense his lats up. So I think about tucking initially. And once I get to the bar, I open up, I set my grip and then I'll, I'll lift my hips up and then I'll brace, I'll brace and spread the floor at the same time. And I like doing it all in one motion because if you do if you brace and then set your hips, it's kind of, it takes longer. And I feel like you can't wedge as well. You can't get as upright. And the fact that I'm so upright, like you said, my back never really, it's not to say I don't feel my back, but I'm not a very back dominant puller. Like if I had to rely solely on my back to be the prime mover, a deadlift, like I think conventional, I could probably get, if I did it for a few months, like mid to high eight hundreds, like I'm not, I'm not no Jamal Browner. I wouldn't be pulling 950 <laughs> conventional. You know, I'm not like that's that's just insane seeing what he did recently. So I know I know my strengths, and that's how I learned to pull the way where I utilize my strengths the most. You know, mm. if you have a strong back, then you figure out the best way to use that. I have strong legs. I have very mobile hips and strong legs. So I found the best way to utilize that to get me stronger, the best position possible to utilize all those muscles. You know, you actually mentioned something that we, we talk about quite a bit, but you mentioned you spread the floor like you like you claw to the ground. Could you talk about yeah. your cues for that? Because when people talk about deadlift, some lifters mention that, some don't. But how like how long have you been doing that, and what is that doing for you? If you can describe to to the listeners what you mean when you say spread the floor with your feet. So spread the floor is basically in my feet. I think about toe down. And I'm kind of just like, uh, clawing. So my toes down. Yeah. Clawing. So my toes down and I'm clawing and spreading the floor is kind of just make sure your feet are, your feet are rotating slightly, but you still have contact with the ground. And that's how you generate all your tension. 
Because what I used to do years ago, back before I realized this, was I would open my hips up and I would spread the floor with my hips, but my feet wouldn't be in good contact with the ground. So then I would have a lot of balance problems and I wouldn't be able to stabilize at lockout. So a deadlift, like any, anything else, it starts from the ground up. Mm. So if your feet aren't secure and your feet aren't stable, that's going to translate up the chain to the rest of your body. And so I, f- I think about my feet, toe down, spreading them, and then I, o- I squeeze my glutes and I bring my hips in, but you don't want to over – it's kind of I, th- I kind of think about it as your knees, your knees stay over your your midfoot or your shins because mm-hmm. you don't want your knees to cave in, but you also don't want them. Now most people don't have the opposite problem. Most people don't bring their knees too far out, which is what I do sometimes because I'm so mobile in my hips. Ooh. But that can sometimes bite me in the ass just as much as not being not having any mobility at all. And the last few months, I've been using this shoe called Vivo Barefoot, and I've really been loving it. There are there's a lot of brands like them, just a barefoot like apparel, a barefoot like shoe brand. And I've always had wide feet. And for years, I mean, all my life, basically, I wear shoes that were too tight. All my toes would be crammed. And then the feet in my, the feet in my foot or the, the muscles <laughs> in my feet became kind of dormant. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like if you wear shoes that aren't meant for actual feet, the muscle in your feet start getting weaker and weaker. And that can translate to squatting and deadlifting and anything else. Like, so my feet have gotten, They've actually kind of sprawled out and gotten wider. I didn't believe it at first because they sent me a free pair and I was like, whatever, this is probably like every other barefoot shoe I've ever tried where it's most barefoot shoes are very minimalistic, but they don't last long because the materials aren't great. Mm. And after like a week or two, I just noticed I could feel the ground more like the muscles in my feet were just like, they were just more in sync. And then once I started using them for deadlifting, it helped with my balance and even spreading the floor on deadlift. And, uh, I think they're based out of the UK, the brand Vivo Barefoot. Mm-hmm. I don't know a whole lot about them, but yeah, I, I've been wearing, I wear them to work out and I have a casual pair too. I try to wear them as much as I can just because once you, once your feet are actually working and they just feel like they're firing right, I don't want to wear shoes that are too tight and that cram my feet mm. and aren't comfortable. All right. Stupid deadlift questions. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can't get the weight off the floor quickly. I can't get the weight off the floor explosively. And I end up doing a lift as a two part lift. What do I do? So if you can't get off the floor quickly, obviously, I mean, an old school one's deficits, deficits help build up, can build up your strength off the floor. I also, I think pause deadlifts are really good too, but I see a lot of people just do them too high. You don't want to do them right below your knees. Just like, like a half half inch to an inch off the ground mm. it'll teach you to be in the position you need to be in because a lot a lot of times people's hips shoot up off the floor but with pause deadlifts it it forces you you can't cheat it because you have to you have to stop it pretty close off the ground so those two things i would say are now there's other things but generically i would say those two exercises are pretty good and for positioning and just overall strength off the floor. what about lockout somebody has a horrific lockout what can they do for their lockout Mm. i feel like a lot of times lockout it's either if they don't um if they don't know how to wedge their back right and they're just they're uh because if they're too loose in their back from the start cueing your yeah cueing your lats so i guess i remember seeing years ago when you had caller woolam on he was doing those crazy rows (laughs) like any variation of rows will help with that obviously i I was just amazed seeing him do 495, 550. He's like in the fives, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, that dude was sub 200 pounds at the time. I was like 240. And I was like, I can't even do that. What the fuck? You know, like, (laughs) yeah. But also, so when people struggle at lockout, I feel it's either, it's either their back or glutes, because if your glutes aren't activating from the very beginning, you can get a weight off the ground. But once you get past your knees, your glutes is a big part of bringing your hips through. So, um, I usually, in the past, I've done GHR. That's mainly back, but you can make it glutes. Um, never really done hip thrusters. I don't know. I feel like hip thrust is an exercise where it's all over Instagram because of bodybuilding and stuff. Right. But I've just, I haven't done a lot of accessories in the past for a long periods of time. I just get, I do a lot of reps and a lot of technique practice. And because at the end of the day, powerlifting is, you know, a sport where it's like squat, bench, and deadlift. So, Especially in the beginning, if you don't have a lot of experience just doing the list more often, mm. you're gonna like you're gonna find your form and you're gonna integrate those motor patterns. Cause I've been powerlifting 
since 2014. So that's geez, that's like eight years. And I've been lifting since I was 13. So it's like the more time I've gotten under the bar, you just have a better body awareness of what's going on, you know. And if you're just in the beginning and you might be struggling with off the floor at lockout, it may just be you're just your technique sucks and you just need to ingrain better technique. Like I believe accessories are important, but I focus on the compound lifts and perfecting them. And then I worry about doing accessories. Like in the very beginning, I worried about the compound lifts. And then the accessories came along once I felt like I had a good, I had a good enough technique in all the lifts where I was like, okay, I actually know what I'm doing. So now I can identify my weaknesses. So your favorite assistance exercise for deadlifting is just more deadlifting probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, after I'm going to do the American Pro in July, but after I definitely want to do a good long block of conventionals because I feel like regardless of which, of which stance you do, I mean, there's great care over like conventional is going to build up my back. And I feel like conventional is more, I could gain a lot of strength in my back and that would carry over great to sumo, even though my back isn't a prime, isn't a prime driver in my sumo A heavy lockouts. My back can maybe start to, my shoulders can start to creep down and kind of get soft. So I've gotten bigger. I'm the biggest for this meet. I went at 276 because I wanted to break the 308 record. Mm. And last year I was 265 for the showdown. Yeah, I got to a low 270s. I was like 271. And then I drank like three liters of water the hour before weigh ins. So I gained like four pounds of it. Was but I've never felt so descended in my life. I felt like I was kind of a bodybuilder. I was like, wow, so this is <laughs> like I still had abs, but it, my stomach was pushing out so far. It was. It was wild. I didn't know that's possible. Dog, how old are you? <laughs> no, I'm 28. All right. Damn. 15 years of lifting. So how do you feel right now, like, in terms of your powerlifting career? You've been powerlifting for eight years. Um, how's your body feel? Like, what are your what are your goals right now in, in terms of, like, the type of numbers that you're trying to get to? Because, I mean, I think I, I saw a post and it said your coach said that. I mean, you, how much more weight do you think you could have pulled on that day? Because it came up fast. Um, yeah, so like I said, the fact that I didn't have time to uh, didn't have time to trade with the Kabuki, I was going off of what I knew I was capable of on a Texas bar. I knew I would get a thousand on a Texas bar. There was no doubt. Mm -hmm. Now the thousand twenty five, who knows? I'm not going to speculate because that's if there's no ifs, you know. But I think I probably had a thousand forty, a thousand fifty because the thousand twenty five, it was. It's like I thought about going for a fourth, but at that point, you're so fatigued. Even if you're capable of a weight after that. I'm going to get two minutes rest and I'm not going to be recovered. And I've heard, I forgot where I read this somewhere, but it takes four to six minutes to recover your, your ATP or your energy, your energy system. So even if I'm capable of it, I'm probably not going to get it if I have two minutes rest. So, yeah. but, but I'm not mad. Cause obviously I didn't even know I'd be at that point going into the meet. So it was a, it was a great surprise, but yeah, I think for my next meet, now, I did take it easy on squat at this meet because I've had, I mean, I've been in the military the last six and a half years. Wow. I'm in the Marine Corps right now. So all that running I've done, I mean, my first four years, I would run three, four miles a day. Mm -hmm. It was brutal. And then I'd squat and deadlift, you know, <laughs> or I'd only squat once a week and deadlift once a week, but trying to trying to do lower body on days when you're, you wake up at four or 5 a.m., <laughs> you got to do a couple mile run and whatever kind of PT they have planned. <laughs> So for a few years, my progress was really stalled because people always ask me, you know, a lot of military people are like, how, how do I get stronger and do the military stuff? I'm like, well, you can kind of maintain it, but I didn't, the last two years since I ha haven't ran as much, my recovery's gotten better, my sleep, everything else. And that's translated into my lifting. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I was, I was stuck at, I was stuck at a 750 pound deadlift for three and a half years. And that was mainly because of the military and just all my other obligations and whatnot. But the last two years, I've just skyrocketed because when you can control all those factors, the best of your ability, it's like, it's like a drug within itself. You know, you sleep six to eight hours. You're actually drinking enough water every day. Like people don't realize how important that is. They want to talk about other things that make, that can help you. But those things are just as important in the equation as well. What's your nutrition look like? So mainly, I was eating about 6,000 calories a day to, to be able to make 276. And uh, I don't want to say it's vertical diet, but I eat a lot of red meat, rice, uh, pasta. Well, obviously pasta is a vertical diet, but <laughs> red meat, rice, pasta. For breakfast, I'll have like eggs, eggs, rice, 
and toast or a bagel, something of that nature. So I kind of, I keep it simple because I'm not a great cook. I'm not, I wish I could make these fancy dishes that taste good, but I can't. So in order to stick to a decent diet, I just, now I put like seasonings and, you know, pink Himalayan salt on it and whatnot, but there isn't a ton of variety, but I'm a kind of person who I love to have a certain amount of structure just in my life in general. Mm. That It makes it easy for me to get things done, having that structure in place. So that's why I've always kind of been, and people make fun of me sometimes like, oh, that's all you eat. But like, I know if I try to do other things and try to be fancier, it'll just, I'll end up just giving up my big fuck it. Where's the, where's the nearest Taco Bell right now? Like, I'm just hungry. <laughs> you know, dude, you, uh, you mentioned, uh, you did running for multiple years, right? Before you, you, you've, you kind of start skyrocketing as far as your deadlift's concerned. And it makes me wonder, like, in terms of your training, do you do a lot of uh, higher rep work ever? Um, because, you know, you have a, you've built up a capacity, right? The three to four miles of running, it's not like that strength training, but your ability to handle stress or volume, um, I think is probably higher than most people since you have that background. Do you think that that's reflected into the way that you're able to train these days? Um, or do you, what, what kind of difference do you think if it's, it's made, if any, I definitely think so early on during those days when I was running a lot, I would tend to ease up on volume just a tad because I was worried about getting injured and, but it's translated now to where, even though I'm bigger, I'm 265, 270, mm -hmm. I have a great work capacity. Now I've obviously, I still have to push myself in the gym to do the reps, but compared to most people, my size, I can handle for for accessories, I tend to go moderate weight. I don't go too heavy. Like if I do barbell rows, I'll do 225 to 315, set to 10 to 12. I don't, I kind of view accessories as a way to like, after the compound lift, the accessories is kind of to get blood in the muscle, almost kind of start the process of recovery, just mm -hmm. get a lot of oxygen and blood in the muscle. And also to work on imbalances. Cause I've had, I've had a lot of issues in the past with my lats back when I did over under grip. It caused a huge imbalance in my lats because my underhand would always take over so much. Mm. So I have a few little imbalances that I struggle with sometimes. So I use the accessories to help like counter those imbalances along with just because I noticed too when if I'm like pressed for time and I only it's a squat workout. If I only do my compound squats, then I have to leave. I'm always a lot more sore than if I do some accessories like leg press, do a set or two, one or two back exercises. So I really do believe like accessories can have multiple benefits. It's not just, yeah, it's to get you stronger and work on your weaknesses, but I did notice the recovery aspect. Now, once again, I don't go terribly heavy on accessories. Obviously if I was doing 495 rows, I'd probably be a lot more sore, but mm. yeah, that's, I tend to have a different view on accessories in the beginning. I kind of wanted to be like everyone else. I want to do these crazy, these crazy rows, these crazy leg presses, put 20 plates on the leg press, but yeah, that r quickly right away. I was like, yeah, I can't, I can't freaking do that. That's not going to work. So I kind of found that my happy medium, it's like, it's not light, but it's kind of moderate in weight. Mm. Cause like I said, if I'm going to fuck my shit up, it better be doing a squat bench or deadlift. Not if I tear a, if I tear a muscle doing leg press, I'm going to be way more, I'm going to be so pissed. Cause I'm like, I already did the hardest part of the workout and I'm doing an accessory and my legs just snap, you know, like, mm. so that's kind of how, that's why I tend to be more moderate in my weight with accessories. I had so many people over the years, they were so excited to beat me on like a lap pull down. <laughs> and I'm like, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, like, okay, you, know? bro, you win. You win. <laughs> yeah. You win. I never cared too much about the assistance exercises. I do think that like maybe for the younger athlete, for somebody for just getting in and they have trouble getting as much as they need from the bench squat and deadlift. Cause they're not that strong yet. I think that's where the assistance exercises uh, pay off big time. Then also, I think there's a difference between the upper body and the lower body. For some reason, bench pressing uh, responds great to like a lot, a ton of uh, overtraining, a lot of volume, a lot of variety. Most big benchers, you hear them say like they do tons of lockout work. They do a lot of uh, incline dumbbell pressing and flat dumbbell. You're just like Jesus Christ! Like, what are you in the gym for like three hours? But a lot of times. Uh, that's what a lot of those guys, those guys are doing. What are, <laughs> what are some of the other numbers you got in this meet? Because you totaled 2071, uh, yeah. and, and what'd you end up squatting? What'd you end up bench pressing? So like I said, squat, I was very, I mean, I squatted 606 and my PR is 750. I know at my next meet, I'm going to do 800. I know it. I'm, I'm capable. It's just, I've been having this horrible 
probably the last year and a half, I've been shifting really bad in my hips. So my last prep, I actually, I didn't tear. It was just like a, I strained my quad because I was, I was shifting so bad to my left side. I ultimately ended up like, I, I was doing 650 for a triple. And by the third rep, I was so crooked. I basically squatted 650 on one leg. And then when I, right as I, right as I went to lock out, I felt it kind of tinge up. And I was like, oh, it's, that's not good. But I knew it wasn't bad because I wouldn't have been able to lock it out after I felt it like cinch up. But within a week, I was bending my leg again. It wasn't anything serious. But since then, I've really, I felt part of it to my glutes. Like I feel like one of my glutes tends to, tends to overtake the other. Mm. Like I feel like my left, my left glute is stronger than my right. Or maybe it's vice versa, but I've been doing a lot of prehab stuff to kind of sort that out. And since I'm doing another meet in four months, there is no point to squat the one lift that I get injured the most on, or I tweak muscles the most on. So I kind of pick my, I pick my times to push my squat. Like I'd say six, seven months of the year, I stick between five and 600 pounds, even though I squat around 750. I'll just do pause, pause squats, um, you know, SSB. I'll do variations and things to make it harder, but I don't. And it, being in the military too probably plays a part. I don't, if I squat heavy for too long, I'm just really, I'm really at a risk for injury in my opinion. Mm. So squat, I only did 606. Bench, I did 440. And I was really happy about that because bench has always been my weakest lift. And a lot of it's mental. Anytime I go over 400, I just start to psych myself out. Mm. And I don't know why, because I'm definitely really big now and I have the muscle in certain places and I'm powerful enough. But once I did four. A few weeks ago, I did 400 for three for the first time. And that's when I knew, okay, I'm good for 440 to 450. There's no way. If I could rep out 405, I know I got 40 to 50 more pounds on me. So that was good. I felt like I had I felt like I had about 5 to 10 kilos in me on bench. So for my next meet, which is the American Pro, my goal is to squat 804, bench, I don't know the kilo, like 472, 473, whatever kilo that comes out to. And then deadlift probably like a thousand fifty to a thousand sixty. That's yeah, nasty. Because my goal would be to break twenty three hundred and possibly, if it's there, go for the total. Because I think at two seventy five, it's still twenty three nineteen or twenty three twenty. Yeah, but I'm, that's going to be in the back of my mind because I mean, long term, my PR, my yeah. Because I I've seen with other people when you try to go for these these crazy goals and they're they're not out of reach, but when you try to like go for them too soon, it kind of doesn't ever work out that way. It always works out when you train hard, you keep getting better, and then it just kind of falls into place with your training and with like just how things are going. Yeah, yeah. Give, giving it the time it needs. Um, I, w- I want to go into that at, like soon, but a question I want to ask you is, uh, on the com- on when I saw the video of the 1025, um, a lot of people are like, oh, he's double overhanding that, that's crazy. <laughs> so a lot of people still, number one, don't know what hook grip is, but what would your advice be to somebody who's trying to be able to build up their hands? Most people, their thumbs can't handle it. So I'm curious, how did you build up your ability to hook grip? And what are your tips for people trying to actually be able to hook grip well? Because you mentioned your over under. That's one of the reasons why I pulled hook grip, like when I was focusing on deadlift, because there's just these imbalances that you can't fix when you're going over under. You have to maybe switch yeah. around every now and then, and that'll cause lat imbalances. So why did you do hook? And what is your, if you're going to tell people this is how you develop hook grip, what would it be? How would you describe it? I love how bad Dan is sweating right now, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, because no, I'm, I'm in my car right now, and I don't, I can't turn the car on because then my headphones will be disconnected to my car Bluetooth. Oh, no. it's com- so I don't want that to happen. It's complicated. And then I just open... Yeah, I just opened the door to try to leave me. Yeah. I was starting to get insecure because I was thinking they probably see me on camera and how some bad big, this is. Right some now. big guy problems over there. <laughs> yeah, no, I just I walk I walk a block and I'm already soaked. But uh yeah, so with hook grip, I did it in high school when I was playing football for like cleans and uh didn't do a lot of snatches. Yeah, snatches remember that thing, but so I had some experience doing it with very lightweight with cleans mm. and then and then once I started doing hook grip for with a Texas bar, I would say, especially at first, like people make the mistake. They're like, I'm going to try hook grip. Their max is 600. The first time they try hook grip, they're trying to go for 600. It's like, you got to do it in baby steps. Like first, maybe at first to start doing a warm up with your hook and then do some like light holds with 50% of your max as things to help like desensitize your thumb. Cause I believe over time, the nerves in your thumb, they kind of, 
I don't know how to describe it, but they, they get more numb to the. They just get numb. Yeah, yeah they just get numb. Just smash that with a hammer. Was painful. Yeah, no, it's because people <laughs> always say, "Oh, oh my God, you did hooker." But to me, hooker is easier once you, if you can get over the pain and if your thumbs start to become adapted to it. Yeah, like I don't even feel like. I mean, I'm gripping the bar, but hook to me is more of like you're just maintaining pressure between your thumb and I use my middle finger, but some people use their uh, their pointer finger. You're just pushing, your thumb is pressing against the, uh, pressing against your finger, and you're maintaining tension with the bar in your hands. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm able to sit the bar really low and hold on to it. Mm-hmm. Most people, when they do hook, they sit the bar too deep in their palm, and what's going to happen is it's going to, it's going to have the tendency to roll because it's so deep in your palm. Yeah. Because people think about it like reverse grip. When you do reverse grip, you grab the bar and it's kind of in your palm somewhat. But with hook grip, you don't want to do that. Like that's. I would not be able to hold on to any weight if I did that. Because like I said, once the bar, especially with a kabuki bar, if you try to do hook like that, that knurling is really going to tear apart your your hand, your palm, Mm -hmm. whatever it's in contact with. So yeah, once again, I would say just a progression of start with very lightweight and do holds at very lightweight. Because like I said, it it took me like a year. It honestly did. Because I was tearing calluses left and right. But then after a year, it started, and no one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear, oh, it's going to take more than a month. But that's the, I mean, it could be different for everybody, but for me, it took a year, and I had already had experience. Well, it was with us, it was with a lot softer knurling, but with Olympic lifting. So I would say six months to a year is normally probably how long it takes. But once you get to that point, it's fun after that because yeah. you just, you, you feel, you feel the weight, but it just, it's not, it's not painful anymore. And then I always do, I do a bunch of my warm-ups with straps just to kind of – because with straps, I'm closer to the bar. The straps kind of pull your – well, unless you're using figure eight straps, but I don't use those because I don't want to – I don't want to get too comfortable with straps like that. But when I wear straps, it brings my hands close to the bar, so then I'm kind of slightly more bent over. So it strengthens my back and my posterior chain because I'm not in as great of a position as when I grab the bar with hook. Mm. So, Do you do anything specific with your grip or – is it mainly just deadlifting? I mean, not for grip, but I like doing, cause I've noticed this is weird, but I like to work my forearms, not like with heavy weight or anything, but do uh, wrist curls, wrist curls and get a bar and do front and back forearm curls. Cause I notice my wrists start to hurt when I don't train forearms. I only do it like once a week, maybe twice a week, but and I've talked to other people before too, where they say if they don't train forearms so every so often, their wrists and kind of the ligaments around their ligaments around the wrists, they start getting weaker and it'll hurt to bend and stuff. So I don't do anything for strict grip because I'm so far along that like I don't need to worry about grip anymore. But like I said in the beginning, I would just do like 10 to 15 second holds at lighter weights with hook or even just when I did reverse grip. That's what I used to do to to practice grip. Um, I remember back in the day, I don't remember how many years ago, but Chris Duffin used to show he would do, he would do hook grip on the pull up bar, on a pull up bar. Mm-hmm. I mean, I never tried that. Like, I never needed to, do, but that that could possibly work too. Anything to kind of help desensitize your thumbs is definitely going to help with hook. Hey, I know you're enjoying this episode, but listen up. We've partnered with Merrick Health. They're a telehealth network owned by Derek for more plates, more dates. But literally, the amazing thing about Merrick Health and getting your labs done with them is that when you get your labs done, you work with a client care coordinator that goes over your labs and gives you specific supplementation or nutrition protocols or potentially hormonal protocols for your levels. The problem with a lot of these other telehealth networks is that when they do these things, they give everybody the same exact things, which actually can hurt you long-term more than to help you. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com. That's M-A-R-E-K Health.com. And if you already know what labs you want to get at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT10 to save 10% off all of those labs. If you don't know where to start, head over to MerrickHealth.com slash POWERPROJECT. And you guys will get directed straight to the Power Project panel that has 26 different labs that will cover everything you need. And at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save $101 off of that panel. Again, MerrickHealth.com. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. What uh, made you? What made you join the Marine Corps? So I was, I was twenty going on twenty one, and I did a year of college, and then I dropped out because I was only there to play football, and I didn't really have, didn't really have the best mindset for going to school. I just wasn't in the right mindset to wanna. Didn't know. I was like, oh, I'll be a, 
I'll, I'll do exercise science because I love working out, but I didn't know much beyond that. And I just didn't want to accumulate a lot of debt and just for, for no reason. I don't know. Like, I feel like in certain fields it makes sense, but if you have exercise science, that's a dime a dozen. There's so many people with an exercise science bachelor's degree. So I dropped out and then I was working Home Depot and construction for a while. And then I joined the Marines because I just felt like I still didn't have a concrete path. And I mean, think about it. Four years of your life is really, it's not, people act like it's an eternity, but it's not like, especially all these kids, they join at 18 and they get out when they're 21, 22, like still got the rest of your life. At it. So even if you absolutely hate it, which I don't, but like it's four years of your life, then you get benefits, you get free college, like use a VA home loan to get a home at a very reasonable percentage down, you know? So that was kind of why I was like, I got nothing to lose. I mean, what, what, what's really, what could really happen? You know? So you could get, I don't regret it. You could get deployed. <laughs> that's what could happen. Yeah, that, actually. Yeah. That's the one thing I wasn't really thinking about. Well, you know, I, watched, like, yeah. I, I have been deployed, but I got, I went to Australia in 2018. So that's not like, yeah, it's not, I don't guess it was, it was, fun. I did some tours in Australia. Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Me and them kangaroos. It was rough. Dude. It's so hot down there, like, uh, and it's because it's in this the net the uh, in the opposite hemisphere. Even though we were there from spring, we were there from spring to so we got there in March or April, and we left in we left in October. So, but that's their colder months because, like I said, I I was so confused at first because it was still it was eighty to ninety degrees, and they're like, yeah, this is like our winter time weather. I'm like, what the fuck, and then. <laughs> Like, and then if if we would have been there the other months of the year, apparently, I don't remember, I think it's called suicide season, but like, it Ooh. gets so hot down there, it's like prime time for people to like, it's kind of like people here when it gets too cold outside and it gets, like when it's winter time, a lot right. of people kind of get those emotions. Yeah, I would feel the same way if it was that, if it was 110 degrees, Phew. 70, 80% humidity, like, God yeah, dang. yeah, that was brutal, but yeah, I've never never been deployed to uh middle east or anywhere and uh now now actually i think mark you've been to i'm with the world famous body bears in washington dc have, have you visited them for absolutely i have yeah i've been to that marines barracks and uh it was uh it was a uh, like oh are you still there oh, there, there you go. yeah yeah it was my, my uh battery 20 percent came on okay yeah <laughs> it was uh it was a wild experience you know, they're telling these guys are telling me like what they train for, and they train to like carry soldiers that that have died, uh, you know, in battle or otherwise. And I was like, holy! Sh I mean, it was it was interesting. I mean, they took me through, uh, you know, uh, their living quarters, and uh, they told me how strong they need to be, like to carry those caskets and things like that. It was yeah. uh, it was interesting. And then when I was there, um, just for some reason, there there happened to be. Uh, someone really high ranking that came through and everyone went, Pshew! they went flying up against the wall and I didn't know what to do. I just saw everybody. So I was like, I'll go up against the wall. I don't know what's going on. And the guy was like at ease, like you're, you know, uh, you're not, you know, with, with everybody else or whatever. And I was like, okay. And I was like, what the hell was that about? And they're like, oh, that was a three star or whatever. And I was like, holy shit. Okay. Yeah. General. Yeah. yeah general. Everybody. Like, Everybody stands by when there's a general. Yeah, yeah. that's like scared the fuck yeah. out of me. I was like, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> Is this guy going to kill me? <laughs> yeah, that was a yeah, cool but experience. It's, it's definitely, I've been there a year and a half so far, and it's it's been great because you're. it's a very selfless job, and you give back in a way that is unlike anything else. We go to Arlington National Cemetery. We perform our funerals. We do it with flawlessness and bearing, and we just take every bit of our job very seriously because we want to make sure the family – it's the best funeral possible for their loved one. And it teaches you a lot about just about life and how grateful you are. Cause it, it can be sad sometimes, but it's also, you know, you realize how lucky you have it when you see all these, it, these circumstances that you come across being in that kind of job. Yeah. I never thought I'd end up at D DC of all places. I didn't even know, I didn't even know uh, the Marine barracks existed until, uh, so I was in Virginia in 2020 during Right when COVID started. So as soon as I got to Virginia, I had to be quarantined for two weeks for no mm. freaking reason. I'm like, okay, this is dumb. But I was, uh, I, I went to the school to be, uh, to work at embassies. So Marines, Marines around the world help protect the U.S. embassies that are located in all these countries. And then 
fortunately that didn't work out. I failed the school. So then at that point I was weighing out my options and my friend told me, Hey, you know, in Washington DC, 40 minutes up the road, there's the world famous body bears. And I was like, like, damn, you know, this might be it. And I went there, I tried out. And then a few months later I came back and did the school and it took me nine, nine and a half months to graduate. But yeah, it's something I'll never forget because it's just, it's one of those things. It's one of the best, biggest things in the Marine Corps that you could say you've done, you know, like how many people could say they've done the things the world famous body bears and me while I'm there have done. It's just a very, it's something I'll always forget. I'll always remember for the rest of my life, honestly. Yeah, I was that's, in the, that's how great it is. I was in the area with my family and uh, I was like, Hey, I want to hit up a gym. Where should I go? And a couple of people were like, I'm at 24 hour fitness or like they were <laughs> had all these kind of lame <laughs> gyms and like want to come to the Marine barracks. I was like, fuck yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> and uh, I met a lot of amazing people that day. It was really incredible. Yeah. Are you, yeah. Are, you know, I, or go, go well, ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Like, I still don't know if I'm going to, cause I'll be at eight years in 2023, but regardless, it'll just be a time of my life. I'll always never forget, you know, being in the Marines. Everybody has different experiences with the Marines, but, you know, I can say I gave back in some way. And even, it's been hard to juggle powerlifting at times, but I wouldn't have it any other way because I could say I've done both these things and done them pretty well, I feel. So So at this point, you don't have to do any of the Marine running anymore, huh? Like, you, you can just focus on powerlifting training and still do that aspect? No, so we still have to do our physical fitness tests, which I'm going to do in late May. It's a three-mile run. Uh, you got to do max sit-ups in two minutes and then, uh, max pull-ups. Uh, we just in, in DC, it's just, we have, uh, our main priority is Arlington. So it's kind of like when I was at Camp Pendleton at the unit I went to, it, it was just ran differently. So we'd run every day, but as world famous body bears, we have to be at least 220 pounds. Mm. We got, to we got to be able to rep 225, 20 times on bench press. We do behind the neck press 20 times with one. 135 or one yeah 135 and then we did uh one thir- 315 squat for 20 reps and bicep <laughs> curl bicep curl 115 for 20 reps that's so, the standard t- yeah that's to pass a school you have that's to do so all cool. those uh markers yeah it's it, it it's crazy man and we we still have to run we still have to be able to pass the the running test too it's not like mm. Everybody thinks we get a handout, but that's definitely not the case. Trust me, and I wish it was like hey, that. Hey, they but. they uh they hold these caskets for like long mm. periods of time, and they are just they're standing like they, with a posture, like they're not moving. You mm-hmm. know, so you I, w- I would imagine you got you better be fucking strong. Yeah, it's cardio. I mean, I still do cardio. I do steady state cardio. I'm not doing crazy, but three to four times a week, I'll do twenty to thirty minutes of steady state cardio. But even at Arlington, I mean, I'm I'm definitely out of breath by the end of some of these funerals, especially when it gets hot out side in the summer and we're wearing these coats that is trapping all the heat but yeah i mean having a i feel like even if you're a power lifter or just in general you need to have a basic level of fitness just for your overall for your heart and anything else like i mean sometimes people like to say oh i'm a power lifter so i can just you know my main focus is strength but then it's like even at the meet like the better like I, i've done a lot of uh stuff to build up my work capacity and it showed at my meet because i was warming up every time and I felt fresh still because I did all those reps and I paid my dues and built the foundation. And when people don't do that, I feel like that's why a lot of people could do bad at meets because if they don't have their work capacity built up, then they have to, most people, most, a lot of people don't do SBD days, right? Mm. So I only do squat, bench, and deadlift sessions. So in order to, to be able to handle that at a meet, you got to have a certain level of fitness to be able to, I'm talking about in terms of lifting, but I also do cardio as well, to be able to handle, okay, I'm warming up for squat and I'm warming up for bench cool now it's time to warm up for deadlift yeah it's, that's my opinion what kind of cardio did you do i was usually just uh step master this basic treadmill it's it was more so for this meat because i had to be a lot bigger it actually helped stimulate my appetite so i was eating five six times a day and by the third meal my appetite was non-existent so it's kind of like how stan Efferding says you know walk 10 minutes after a meal uh, sometimes i would just do that i'd be like fuck it i'll walk for five minutes right now and maybe maybe i'll be hungry I wouldn't be totally hungry, but it, it would definitely help kind of get the digestion going and kind of kickstart my metabolism. Because especially when, just as much if you're losing weight, when you're, when you're gaining weight, cardio is actually still kind of important. Because if I didn't do any cardio and I just tried to stay off my feet as much as possible, I definitely, I might have gained the weight, but uh, my composition wouldn't have been great. 
it would have been just like I wouldn't have looked the way I did. It definitely any uh, a lot any specific mobility work? I mean, you did mention like the hip circle, and you mentioned some stuff you do. Uh, like kind of sounds like you just kind of warm up on the deadlift and maybe go, but like, do you do anything real specific, like to stretch your hamstrings or your upper body or anything like that? Mobility work. So one of the problems I've had lately is I have really tight lats. So what I like to do is, well, there's several things you could do. So you get a, a band with enough resistance and you kind of, you put it, you put your feet under one side of the band and then you kind of, you bring your elbow up and it's kind of imitating doing that stretch. But when you're big enough, you can't really reach and touch your elbow and pull it back. So I like using a band to open up my lat. Mm. Yeah, I'm ashamed, but I just can't do it anymore. <laughs> or, or what I've also, another thing I've heard and done is you get a PVC pipe or so, something you can hold on to, and you, you lean over to a bench and kind of push mm -hmm. push your elbows down. Absolutely. Once again, Im imitating bringing your elbows through, and in the process, your lats open up. Because in the past, whenever I have tight lats – it kind of inhibits me in ways on all my lifts. If my lats are tight and squat, I'm not going to be able to set my shelf and be able to get, be in a good position to, to set the bar down. On bench is a nightmare because if my lats are tight, it's going to cause stability issues. And sometimes even my pec tightens up because of my tight lats. So I really try to stay on top of that. I mean, you could use a massage gun, but I feel like those kind of mo module, how do you say that? Those, those types of things. like, uh, <laughs> yeah, those types of things. They only get so deep. And when you have enough muscle and you're dense enough, you need to find ways to manipulate your body to really open up those, oh, yeah. those tight muscles. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you, man, uh, going back to what you were mentioning earlier, where like there are these records you're trying to break, um, but you're not trying to do too fast. You know, a lot of lifters, they, they, they start progressing. They start feeling really fucking good. Everything's Everything's in the cards, everything's going well, and then they rush towards it and then just bad shit happens. So I'm curious, where did where did your mindset for that like start to change? Have you been that type of lifter who's like steady, the steady individual wins the race? Did you have a period of time where you were just going for it and you fucked up? Like what made you what gives you that mindset? So in the beginning, I mean, at least on deadlift, I went from my first meet in 2014, I pulled six hundred. Six months later, I pulled 700. So off the gate, I'm like, sweet. I added 100 Damn. pounds in six months. Shit. So then I'm thinking, okay, I'll pull 800 in a year or something. And then obviously that didn't happen. I wasn't even close. And then once I joined the Marines, that's when I started to realize I need to be more methodical because especially with my, at times, very physically taxing job, I have to account for that. So there's days where I'd have to like lift less weight or decrease the intensity. So kind of being in the Marines for so long has kind of made me kind of more uh level-headed mm. like even if i want to do i couldn't just like put on the gas and like go hard for six months not because if i get injured like that's not going to go well with they're like yeah you're strong but you just tore a muscle that's not cool man like you can't what are you going to do at work now you can't you're immobilized you know yeah so i kind of just i'm not scared of getting injured but i'm smart because i know this isn't my livelihood so if i get injured that can affect that can affect other things so it's kind of made me take things one one step at a time and knowing okay it might take me a year to do this instead of eight months but the trade-off is i'll be healthy and like i'll be slowly progressing i mean you in the beginning when you have the newbie gains from certain things you can you can bump it up very quickly but you reach a point where your ligaments and tendons if you keep trying to go on that trajectory yeah things are going to happen and so you gotta you gotta take it in steps so that your body can build up to what your muscles already are capable of if that makes sense. Um, you mentioned uh, Arlington National Cemetery. Do you guys serve the, I believe it's called the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers? Is that what it's called? Yes. Well, we, we don't serve them. They're their own separate entity. Mm. But the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is, it's, they have their own thing down there. I've, I've heard stories about it. I haven't been down there yet personally. Oh, you never checked it out? An, no, I haven't. But I've heard if you make a noise down there, like they like, <laughs> they discipline you really fast. Like you're not, it has to be like a pin drop down there. Cause obviously mm -hmm. it, they're, they're silent in acknowledgement of, you know, all the people who've died and stuff. So yeah, don't anyone who brings a kid or something down there, I would, I would be praying for them because they're going <laughs> to. Yeah. Know, it's one of the cooler experiences I've ever had in my life visiting that. And it was just, uh, I don't know. It's just like, it's a cemetery of people that like fought for the country. I mean, it's, it's hard not to have it move you in some way. It was really, uh, quite amazing. <laughs> 
Are their names unknown or something? Why is it called the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? Uh, so it's, like I said, I don't know, don't quote me on this, but it's, uh, it's called the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier because it's for all the people that haven't been accounted for, Oof. you know, during wars, people who've died and they've never been recovered. And, you know, they're, some people know who they are, but they're not definitively known. So it's like anybody in the military who's ever died and has never been recovered or never been found. It's so, it's like, a, it's like, it's, um, uh, it's honoring them because obviously a lot of people come to Arlington, but there's still a lot of people from world war two, Korea, um, all these operations that died and their bodies were never recovered. Mm. So that, that mm. tomb is kind of uh, designated for them. Yeah. And it's a, it's a ritual that they do and they just kind of do it all throughout the day, like every hour on the hour, like the clock, you know, the bell tower mm. does a ding or whatever. And then they come out and they, they do their thing and they have music and they got a soldier uh, marching back and forth and people are just like surrounding the area and everyone's like just quiet and focused in on uh, the soldier. It's, it's like gives you goosebumps. You're like, this is, <laughs> this is insane. Really cool experience. What do you got coming up next? You mentioned you're going to, you're getting ready for a contest. So are you going to like, you probably need to drop some weight for a little bit and start and uh, kind of like uh, start this whole process over again, right? Yeah, the American Pro is, I think it's about four months out. And my main, the main thing I'm going to focus on is really up in my squat. Cause I know, like I said, my bench is where I want, obviously my deadlift is where I want it to be. My bench is still improving, but I'm really going to, my squat and bench are going to be more emphasis because I know I, I have, I have a couple people within an hour or two who, potentially going to have a kabuki bar so i know just getting used to a kabuki bar and kind of being more comfortable with it i could definitely get the number the number i said earlier like a thousand fifty thousand sixty so but now it's time to put in work on squat because i want to squat 800 that's a number i felt i've been capable of for a few years now but like i said just the wear and tear the running and just i'm not gonna lie squats the one lift where if i feel any sort of pain or discomfort it's really hard for me to want to push past that because i've you see all these you see all these people that quad ruptures, you know, ACL, MCL, like, I, I mean, I know medicine's better now, but that's still something I want to avoid, you know? So, but my, I'm feeling better. My hip shifts better. So now it's just time to slowly do an uphill climb with my squat. Cause I know if I squat 800, I know my bench will be 460 to 470. And even on a, even on a bad day, I'll still pull a thousand. So I know I'll be really close. 2250 to 2300 would definitely be there. And that'll be solid because I don't know what I am. I think I'm 10th or 12th all time at 275 raw. Mm. So I would definitely be like, I think I'd be third or fourth or I don't know. It would be top five to get, get that high of a total. So I, I, I love, I love deadlifting and obviously all the success I've had with deadlifting, but it would be really cool one day to at least get one all time total record, you know, cause that's the one thing no one would ever thought. Cause in the beginning, everyone was always like, Oh, you're great at deadlifting, you know? So people could say, Oh, we knew that was coming. But no, I've always had a mediocre bench, so no one would be like, what? He, he bent his 480, 500 now? You know, like, that would be really cool to, like, bring it all full circle and kind of show that I'm I, – I do believe I'm multifaceted to kind of make sure make sure I fully show it and squat and bench as well in the future. Who's somebody you want to compete against? Like, would you have a lot of fun, you know, going head-to-head -head with, like, Jamal Browner or some of these other guys out yeah. there deadlifting some crazy oh, weights? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was fun to compete against Jamal Browner last year at the showdown. Yeah, it probably him and um it was cool. Last year I met Shane Haller at the showdown. And he's he is a big man. He is big and he's got a big beard. <laughs> just as big of a beard as he is a man. Yeah, and he, he just broke the squat record at uh three oh eight at the the Ghost Clash. Yeah. He squatted like nine twenty five, nine twenty, nine twenty five, somewhere in there. So both of them, it was cool to meet them and like I said, as of right now, I'm doing the American Pro, but it is kind of mixed feelings because I do want to compete with Jamal again because both of us are pushing deadlift, obviously, at that high level. And I feel like it's kind of a letdown if he's, if, if we're not there together because it's, it's fun when you have someone that close to you and it's just like a battle every attempt, you know, to kind of see who has more in you. What's the deal with John Hack? It's what? like, what's up with him? John Hack. Like, what's a, like he's just fucking ridiculous, right? Oh yeah, man. Like if I, if I actually would think about that fully knowing that dude benches like 150 pounds more than me. Yeah. Like I would, I would hang it up right now. Like I really would not, I would never show my face in public again. Yeah. It's all perspective, but he's, he's such a well-rounded lifter and 
Yeah, he been uh when he was in the UK, he went he went to a vet in the UK and he pulled like nine hundred on the Kabuki bar. Mm. So I, I know he likes it too because obviously <laughs> right. that was a PR and it looked it looked pretty smooth when he did it. But yeah, I've been following him for years and he's just his dominance is just insane. You know, he's just so consistent and even if he has a bad day, he'll still break an all time record. So it's like, how do you define a bad day for a guy like that? Mm. Like when he's on, he's on. When he's off, it's like, well, I only broke one record. Okay, bye. And then he just leaves and collects twenty thousand dollars, and then you see him a few months later do the same thing. You know. All right, Doc. I, I have two questions, man. You said he, the closest Kabuki bar to where you train is an hour or two. Yeah. So, oh shit, don't have that car. Um, <laughs> so I know a buddy who's an hour from me who just said he has a gym with one. Mm-hmm. There's like one or two other people who are kind of in the same realm where they're a distance away. Like, it wouldn't be the end of the world if I didn't have a Kabuki, but it's just the timing of it. It's mainly anything over 900 pounds. It's just, I would want to get used to that for reps, kind of yeah. feeling out. Because anything under 880 is kind of just, whether it's a Texas bar or Kabuki, anything under 880 pounds is like, it's so routine that it's hard for me to tell where I'm really at. It's almost like, once I'm like low to mid nines, that's when I really know, okay, this is, like warming up, I knew the eight, my last warm of Bay 80 was good, but I was like, I'm not really going to know until I do my opener at 9, 948 where I really stand. Because my position, you know, it's so crucial. So yeah. if I'm just a tad bit off, it just throws me off. That's the one bad thing about sumo is just, you know, everyone always says it's so technical. When I did conventional, it's like I would pitch forward, but then you could, if you're strong enough, you could kind of get back in position. But you're not doing that with sumo. Like I, I've never seen someone completely, completely get out of position and magically get back into position and finish mm-hmm. a lift. It's just not. It's not a thing. They just give you the bar you broke that record with or send you one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see, hopefully. Yeah, that'd be nice. How much uh, weight have you made just kind of float off the ground? Because you mm-hmm. do aggressively, like, get into position. And when we saw that 1,025 deadlift, like, the weights look like they – uh, almost came off the ground before you ever even really started. You like wedged yourself in position aggressively and it kind of almost looked like, so like, can you make like seven, 800 pounds just kind of almost float or hover before you ever even actually start to deadlift it? Yeah, it's normally, so I, I've become a little less aggressive because like I said, it kind of, at lighter waist now, I tend to be even more conservative because it can kind of throw me off sometimes if I, I've learned to put less and less emphasis on breaking it off the floor. But that being said, anything under 850, like if I'm not careful, it'll just start, it'll start floating. And one time, one time I tweaked my back with like 600 pounds because mm. I went to like spread the floor and it already came halfway up my shins and it kind of like tweaked my lower back. I was like, mm-hmm. did I really just tweak my back doing like 50 or 60% of my max right now? Like this makes no sense. But so that's why I wear a belt. I tend to, after my first and second warm up, I already put a belt on just because I'm so worried about about when I pull the tension out, being pitched forward or possibly throwing me off. I believe a belt. I believe a belt isn't like a. You have to work to use it, and I like using it for timing. So I like to use it from the jump, kind of, with most of my warm ups, just to practice and cue my intra abdominal pressure. I know some people say, "Oh, you shouldn't. You should wait till seventy. I don't know, seventy, eighty percent of your max." But I don't. To me, the few times I've done that, it just, it almost throws me off when I put it on. Mm-hmm. Cause like I said, it's like anything else. You need to practice with it. You're not just going to put it on and you're, you're just going to magically boom. Oh, I'm tight as fuck. Like it takes repetition and just even till now, I still need reps. Like I like warming up with it. I don't want to wait till 800 pounds to put a belt on because it's going to kind of throw me off with my timing. Actually, that that brings up a, a good question. It might sound simple, but what is the way that you breathe into a belt? Like, how do you, what what is your yeah. cue for breathing into your belt? Okay, so this is something I got wrong for so many years, and it wasn't until literally probably a few months ago that I finally kind of realized something. So we always think about, yeah, you want to fill up your diaphragm, mm-hmm. so you always kind of push, you push out in your diaphragm, but something people don't realize is your obliques ensuring that it's 360 degrees of pressure Mm -hmm. so you're breathing out and out into your side to the same time so i've heard the analogy is kind of like a what's it called not a bottle but like a it's like a bottle where it kind of elongates and then it levels out i just think and i i tend to put the belt higher because i notice for the longest time i would just keep my belt around my waist but now i like putting it kind of 
almost below my sternum. It's weird. Like I used to think, why would people do that? That's dumb as fuck. Like obviously <laughs> your diaphragm is more towards your waist, but it almost, I think with bigger guys, it kind of almost helps better to have it a little higher. And so I just cue, I breathe out, but also kind of inflate my obliques at the same time. It's kind of, I'm, I'm still so new to actually bracing correctly that it's still kind of hard to fully explain in simple terms. But I just think about filling up my diaphragm along with kind of filling up my obliques. And then when you wear a belt, it all comes together because you'll know you're bracing right when the belt, you'll just feel literally your whole body just tense up against the belt. Like mm -hmm. your, your obliques along with your diaphragm, it'll just all fill up and then you'll feel the tension throughout the whole belt. And the cool thing is that, yeah. Or, go ahead, go ahead. So, and I, I had low back pain for so long and I started to realize since I was only pushing out, it was putting me into an anterior position with my pelvis. And when you're deadlifting, when you're deadlifting or uh, squatting, when you're deadlifting or squatting, if you're in a very anterior position, that's going to cause back pain. So hmm. improper bracing can kind of bring upon, bring upon back pain that you can prevent through proper bracing. Yeah. And a, a cool thing too, is if like, if people will try to practice the bracing you're talking about, if they stick their fingers into their diaphragm, you know, if you're someone who typically just breathes into your belly and you don't, nothing comes out of the diaphragm, but once you take a full breath and, and try to create that pressure, you'll feel your fingers pop out because of the pressure you're creating yeah, 360 yeah. degrees around. Yeah, that is a good, uh, I've, I've seen that in videos too. That's one thing I forgot to say is people always say you, you have to be able to, you know, if you could fit a finger inside, it's tight, but it's not too tight. Oh yeah. Because if your belt's too t if your belt's too tight, you're going to be know. so restricted <laughs> that you won't be able. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, I gotta wear I gotta wear size forty jeans just to like to fit my legs. So I'm always latching down on my belt. <laughs> uh, obviously, with all the pressure building up, have you ever had a uh, you got a good poop story for us with all these heavy deadlifts? I figured shit shit must have happened somewhere along the lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, I mean, surprisingly, I tend to, before a workout, I either have a very light meal or I have like a, I make like a homemade shake of like peanut butter, bananas, and like a scoop or two, to, a scoop or two of mass gainer or uh, some kind of whey protein Ooh. to prevent that because, yeah, I don't ever want to be in that situation. God <laughs> it, so I'm doing, I'm taking all the measures I need to because if I had a, if I had actual whole meal before a workout, yeah, I probably... I probably have 10 plus stories like that and I could write a whole book on it. Yeah. You don't want to but, mess your uh, strong singlet, right? Yeah. No, I, yeah, I wore the new one, the newest one you have. The, Appreciate that. The black and yeah, no. So one thing I have to say is at the meet. So when I pulled a thousand twenty five, I was wearing, I was wearing the iron rebel socks, but it was only because he's like, I think it was, I'm not even going to say who it was, but someone told me, so I had my white deadlift socks on and because there was blood visible on it, they told me mm. I wouldn't be able to pull a thousand twenty ah. because I had blood on my socks. So then someone gave me a pair of red socks and I just like swapped them out. But the whole time I'm thinking, man, it's just, and I put baby powder and shock to cover it. So it's not like, I had to <laughs> to but yeah, yeah I, I concealed it the best I could <laughs> because they still saw like specks of blood on my, of course it's white socks. I mean, they're not going to, I like looking fresh, so I had white shoes, white socks, you know, whole all look. But I, I never thought – now, that's the thing. When you go to local meets, it's kind of – it's give and take sometimes how things are perceived. That's why, like the showdown and even the American Pro, I know across the board it'll kind of be – at those meets, they could care less about, oh, you got blood on your socks, or, oh, do you, do you have your boxer – or do you have your briefs you're going to wear for the day? Like, mm -hmm. they never ask stuff like that. But at local meets, they're stingy with that stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Like they really harp on the little, yeah, it'd been a few years since I did like a local, a local meet per se. And it was, it was cool. Cause a lot of people, they were surprised that I was there. They're just like, wait, you're Dan Grace. And I'm like, yeah, man, what's up? Like, I'm, you know, I'm just here. I'm going to work out and lift too. It was cool. You know, just to like, can I treat everyone the same? You know, I don't feel like I'm on this pedestal. So I, I'll talk to anybody. You come up to me, I'll give you the time of day. Cause I just don't. I don't see myself as like bigger than life or like I'm somehow better than anyone else. You know, I'm still the same dude who started eight years ago and had like a 1500 pound total and just love working out. So I still, I still think that that same way to this day, cause I've never changed. You know, I don't as as maybe my following has grown and I've set a few records that doesn't, that's not enough to make me change who I am, you know? So I like to kind of 
be transparent with people. Where can people find you? Where can they follow along on social media? So my Instagram is uh, Dan underscore Griggs, D A N underscore G R I G S. And uh, I had a YouTube. I- I'll probably do. I'll probably start my YouTube again, but I don't. I don't remember what it was. But I used to post like random videos, and I wouldn't even put a title. I would just post. This was like five years ago. But I'll I'll, I'll start getting back into YouTube because that would just be another way to connect with people. Or maybe people are telling me I should get a TikTok too. So maybe that's the move. I, I need to get a TikTok so I could do all these dances or whatnot. Yes. Yeah, so. tell these kids how to deadlift, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, educate them. We need more people deadlifting over a thousand pounds, right? Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for your time today. Sorry that you were uh, dying of sweat in the car, but we <laughs> no, no, it. it's fine. I, I just didn't want any excess of sound to be in the car, so I I turned my car off and I didn't want my door open for too long. But thanks for having me on, guys. I really appreciate. It. I've I've been watching, I've been watching the podcast for years, and it's just I love hearing about the topics you guys discuss, and it's just an honor to be on here today. Yeah, it'd be great to have you out here sometime or uh, us come visit you at some point. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, we should definitely get that in the works. All right, my man. Have a great rest of your day. See Catch you later. Thanks. You guys too. Bye. See ya. Bye. Yo. That guy's legit. Yo, he has like, he has that chin that you're like, that boy ate meat growing up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's like, <"Roof." laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Yeah, he's yeah. got that like that. Looks like Mr. Incredible. Looks like Mr. Incredible. <laughs> that marine chin. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. like straight up. They're, like, yeah, Jocko has the same chin. It's mm-hmm. a marine chin. I'm not lying when I say this. My cousin went into the, mar- or not the Marines, the Army. Sorry. <clears throat> Don't, didn't mean to offend a shit ton of people there and kick my ass. They now. get so mad. I know. But <laughs> he went in it's as amazing. just like a normal kid. He came out, fucking big ass John. Like, what are they? What, what, like, is it just the food? I'm like, is there doing anything else to you while you're in there? Cause you look like a man now. Boy, it's a meat. He was getting yeah. those masseters going, you know, built a chin. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. But man, nah, he, that it guy's was, fucking awesome. He's, uh, he is awesome. He was able, like, I think he put forward a lot of really cool deadlift information. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, the, the thing where he's talking about clawing your feet into the ground, some people talk about it, some don't, but that's very important for people being able to activate their feet. You know what I mean? So, that was really cool. It's cool that he did in Vivos and like we've been having massive benefit from those shoes, but mm-hmm. it's cool that even somebody like that felt the difference in terms of what you can do with your feet with those. I'm not even kidding. It's harder to get my feet into shoes now, like mm-hmm. because my feet are, I think they're growing and they're spreading. They're meteor. And maybe I just haven't noticed before. Maybe I haven't been like looking down at them as much, but like uh, it does feel like, and it does appear that my toes are like starting to spread a little bit more. And I mm-hmm. did some barefoot running uh, yesterday just with no shoes on at all and it keeps getting like easier and easier even though it's still hard mm-hmm. um, but I'm actually excited to mess around with some uh, a different version of that like uh, running in a field but I do want to try it with the Vivo barefoots on because I'll be able to run a lot faster and still get a lot of the benefit of uh, kind of clawing my feet in the ground but I want to go like full like man bun on this thing and I want to get like <laughs> all the socks with the with the toes and all that stuff. And I got the happy feet things that I showed you guys. Uh, I'm going to get those too. They're like weird. They're like weird. uh, It looks like lifting gloves for your, you guys can check it out on my Instagram. It looks like lifting gloves for your feet, but it has like these kind of toe separator things. And it it actually, they're actually kind of hard to wear for a while. It starts to feel uncomfortable because it spreads your toes apart quite a bit, but Man, the feet are huge. I mean, he was talking about how he keeps his toe connected. I was doing some kettlebell swings the other day, and you kept telling me, like, I'll keep that toe down. And when I did have the toe down, it didn't feel like I was, you know, of course, didn't feel like I was going to get knocked over. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the when, I'm, when I was swinging the bell without having my toe down, uh, you know, I felt like the bell was swinging me rather than me swinging the bell. Yeah, because you're planted in the ground. Ooh, those feet. I could lick them toes. They chose mm-hmm. a good foot model for that. Mm-hmm. Look at that. Yeah, they do have some interesting colors. It's difficult to get on because, like, your pinky toe, the design of the foot is, like, so interesting. Like, your pinky toe is back. You know, it's like, it's, you know, your your toes, like, descend downward. I mean, sometimes that second toe sometimes is bigger or whatever or longer. Mm -hmm. But your toes come way down. And it's like, when I'm trying to put them on, it's, like, (laughs) difficult to get that last uh, pinky toe jammed in there. But they're fucking awesome. 
fuck pinky toes because I like I always it's always the pinky toe I stub against shit. Oh. It's always <laughs> the pinky toe. It always manages to find the corner or the bed it? frame. And it's like just get the fuck away. It hurts so oh bad. God. Yeah, when, I, when I'm doing corners, so that means I'm on my knees and I'm kind of like swaying back and forth. Yeah. My pinky toes, like when I'm not like fully stretched or whatever, they always like overlap and they, it feels like I'm tying my toes into a freaking knot. Mm. Like it sucks. So yeah, my pinky toes are, they're kind of just there. I don't, I don't know if they do anything right now. Just cut it off. 1,025 deadlifts. Yeah. It's gonna be a very interesting year, to be honest, because I think I don't think that's it. I'm like, glad that I quit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not gonna pick up a barbell again uh -huh. in that way. That way, it's just like I can't even worry about any comparisons. Mm -hmm. I'll do trap bar and I'll do other versions of a deadlift, but fuck that, man, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. How much longer do you think till we get to 1100? Oh, just in 2022 or 2023. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking by the end of this year sometime. Jamal's yeah. already capable of it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, Dan, I mean, who the fuck knows? That's yeah. fucking wild. Well, especially, it's like one of those things, right? Like now that people saw that he did it, mm -hmm. how many more people are now going to do it? Dude, yeah. You he know, just, he just like, he, he like... Nah, I think people have been unlocking that achievement. You know what I mean? Like uh -huh. you see Kaylor, you see uh, Jamal, um, you've just been seeing it. Yuri Belkin. You've seen people do that. You know, now he did this. We're going to start seeing a lot of just freakish deadlift mm -hmm. numbers. Like there's going to be 1,100. Then I wonder what's going to happen after that because it's weird. Jamal and, and Danny, like these dogs don't look like they're stopping or no. slowing down really. Like how old is Jamal? Jamal's fuck, probably 30. Okay. It may be, maybe he is around 30. there. Maybe he's 30. Yeah. Yeah. He's but not like, old. He's not old, but, and he looks healthy Yeah, and he hasn't like, it doesn't seem like he's been suffering any injuries. Like he's just been trucking along pretty steadily. Mm -hmm. um, the big difference is the efficiency. Like these guys are lifting these weights really, really efficiently. Yeah. You know, if you remember like when Eddie Hall did his lift and he's been interviewed about that lift, like he nearly died. Like he had right. a like near death experience. Uh, he was like blind for a while and just, it was nuts. And he had to go to like this deep, dark place. These guys are just like in the gym, pulling 950. Cash pulling nine. for the gram. Yeah. Like, just, just showed up at a local meet. Yeah. Just doing 93%, <laughs> 95% of their max, but that's 935 or 950 pounds. You know, like they're oh. just ripping these weights up. And when you watch it, I mean, the thousand three that he did, like it just, I mean, I, I don't, so I don't think, I don't think I've ever done a deadlift that looked that good uh, in a meet, even when it was an oper, opener, that 1,003 that he did. I mean, he did that faster and better in every possible way that I could even imagine. Like, it's it's awesome. And it's really cool to see that these guys have kind of locked down that efficiency. Um, these are things that Jesse Burdick and I have been talking about for a long time. We met, We would mention how we thought you could do like the most optimal sumo deadlift and it was to follow a lot of what a lot of the Russian lifters were doing at the time. But neither Jesse or I were talented enough to get ourselves into those positions. Although Jesse uh, ended up deadlifting like 854, I think he did. Mm. So Jesse was pulling some big weight. But again, the big weights that we thought were big weights, they're not big weights anymore. 800-pound mm -hmm. <laughs> deadlifts, they're just not... It's not that they're not impressive. It's just that, look, man, there's just a complete different level to all of this. That was so weird. What was that? It's like, it's almost like he's pushing the floor away from him in some weird way rather than like lifting the weight. I'm watching his feet right here. Oh, well, they're fucking the technicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dog. It's crazy. Boy has a dumpy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just lean into that dump truck back there. <laughs> dump beat. Hey, by the way, it's great to hear that he had to change his socks. I'm just so proud of myself for still having haters out there. <laughs> I've been retired from this sport for a long time. <laughs> People are like, fuck Mark Bell and his G Wagon. <laughs> I love it. Dude, that G-Wag is sick as fuck, too. Oh, How long he's he holding that, man? That's amazing. Yeah, he's going to like walk around the block with it. Jeez. Shit. Christ. Honestly, though, he's got the Vivo barefoot. He mm -hmm. is wearing a belt. He's sumo. He's hook gripping. He has a special bar. It's like, I'm going to give him credit for lifting about 225 pounds. Yeah, give or take. I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> right. right. I mean, and audience, that's, that's, that's rounding, fair, right? That's I mean, rounding up. He, he yeah. cheated a lot. Yeah. I mean, guys... I hope he feels bad about himself. <laughs> Comment down below that he's a cheater. 
that's yeah. pretty much it. It's yeah. quite If there's anything we learned, that's the point. I mean. Danny yes. Griggs goes down all time. All time best deadlift. Best how cheating many, deadlift record. How mm-hmm. many deadlifts have we seen done in the Vivo Barefoots? Um, that's the only one I recall seeing. And look, the guy set an all-time world record. So it's I like mean, I, obvious that it, that did a lot of the work for him. Yeah. I want to say, I think maybe I've done one at like 135. Yeah, I've done a couple, you know, but <laughs> I haven't even tried to go heavy. So who knows what would happen? I could have done that shit. Right? Easy. Hook grip? If you hook, bitch, I've been hook gripping that's forever. That's what I'm saying. But if I'm saying hook up grip, all those sumo? Plates, yeah, easy. You, you, you'll probably get 11 by the end of the year. No, no, no. Fucking no sweat, bro. Yeah. It's, it's going to be easy for me. On a kabuki bar? On a, on a kabuki? Come on now. Like, God They're damn. just giving these fucking records away. It's insane. <laughs> the bar bends. It's got all that whip. We got to yeah. quit because somebody's going to think we're serious. Take this way out of context and be like, <laughs> Power Project's talking shit. And Seema only sleeps two hours a night. <laughs> that shit did it's true. Die. People kept believing that shit for years. <laughs> like, oh my he God. only eats 40 grams of protein a day. Yeah, and I <laughs> meditate for an hour every morning. I do a f- 800 push-ups. He still like, eats 1,000 carbs, only 40 grams of protein a day. I've Dog, seen it. Chill. Nah, <laughs> man. I can't, we can't make any jokes without people thinking we're serious. He does eat a lot of legendary Pop-Tarts. Once he eats one, <laughs> he does. Yeah, it's, it's like it's, everybody better get the fuck out of the yeah, way. I can't open the can of worms <laughs> when I do that shit. But no, one thing I will say, one thing I will say, this, it's really cool. Like it wasn't, talking about the shoes, it wasn't the shoes that allowed him to do anything. It's gotta be the but, shoes. But let's think about this. Even he noticed a difference with how his feet have been able to strengthen, how he's able to root into the ground. Like it starts from the feet, right? And if you're using shoes that have too much padding, you're not really developing them, you're leaking a lot of power. Like you said, you noticed a difference in your feet. I've noticed a difference in my feet too with the amount that they were able to spread, the amount of control I have in my feet, the balance that I have now because my I have wide feet anyway, and I've been stuffing my feet into two narrow shoes, right? But now I'm actually able to feel everything. I think that it's going to be really interesting to see some of the top athletes change their footwear into something that's more comfortable, have a bit more foot development. Mm-hmm. That will, it's going to be a small difference, mm-hmm. but that small difference could be fairly substantial. What, you know? if it, what if you're like a boxer or you do like Muay Thai? And every time you step and go to throw a jab, oh my God. I mean, the way that you're stepping off of your foot, if your foot's stronger, I mean, wouldn't it make sense that your striking would be better? Yeah. I mean, shit. So it, a lot of these things, they, they sound, sometimes it can be a little boring to sit here and talk about like walking with your feet straight and some of this shit, but it's like, if you don't have any problems, you don't have any problems. There's, mm-hmm. there's not anything to probably really overly be concerned about or worry about. However, if you do start to run into some problems, there's like ways to solve all these things. And sometimes uh, you got to investigate stuff the way that we do. Go down a rabbit hole of like looking into everything from your neck to your feet to your hands to your butthole. (laughs) Who knows what else we'll get into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shocking that butthole. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Greenfield (laughs) talked about that. But no, so <laughs> back about to the shoes though. It's like you having thing. you know in a, a thousand a thousand horsepower engine, <laughs> and you're trying to drive around on flat tires. Mm-hmm. Like you can't transfer all that force into the street. I'm trying and see. Well, I'm trying. How you go, brother? Uh, <laughs> what happened with your butthole? Something no. new happened. <laughs> 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 and right. take us on Yo, out of here. I'll, 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 okay, I'll, I'll, okay. okay, so okay. we got to find a, a, an affiliate link for Fun Factory because me, me and my girl, we were, we were kind of looking through uh, some some stuff for some booty stuff, we, right? We got it, right? I, no, 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 yeah, we, we do. We'll, we'll get it. But, <laughs> but we find something for, for, you don't know, her booty hole. Um, and she's like, you should get one too. I'm like, ah! I mean, I mean, I know it probably feels pretty good, uh, <laughs> uh, but then we were like, we saw this thing on the Fun Factory You're website. You're like, okay, don't tell anybody. <laughs> then he comes along. I haven't purchased it yet. I haven't purchased it yet. But I'm like, I'm like, that might actually feel pretty good. But anyway, it's like, <laughs> it's this, uh, it's a, it's a butt hook that also has a cock ring on the other side. Mm. <laughs> so you stick it in your booty hole and then you wrap the cock ring around around your gooch. Oh, <laughs> it's like a, okay. <laughs> I'm like, that actually looks like a mark. Real pretty good. <laughs> I'll be real. Pleasure. Hey man. Yeah. Like, like you would ride this thing. You wouldn't ride it. No, it hey, like. no, you don't ride it. Okay, you, sorry. you do your you thing. Sh- you sh- well, you got a little, on. Yeah, you got the, you know what? Take us on out of here, Andrew. <laughs> Stop. That's just a good just way to take us on out of here. 
I believe I can make that affiliate link happen. If I do, make sure you guys check out the uh, YouTube description as well as the podcast show notes for it. Uh, and yeah, let us know how you guys like that one. Go buy but a penis pump. All right. Definitely get a penis pump. Oh, like I'll tell you guys something offline. But um, yeah, make sure you guys comment and like today's episode. Um, li- li- drop us a comment down below. Um, we we're kind of we we're jokingly talking shit about the sumo pool. But let us know what you guys think about the deadlift and uh, follow the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project. Oh, sorry. At MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok and Twitter. Mm. New name change. Sorry about that. And then uh, my Instagram, TikTok and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z and Sima, where are you at? Uh, also, guys, we are on Discord now. So uh, yeah, yeah. Discord link is below. We're going to have a Reddit community soon, too. So we'll have all those links in the bio. Um, but yeah, at Sima in Yang on Instagram and YouTube and Sima Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Mark? Do we have, did you mention a Bytes page? Do we have oh, yeah, the Clips page. Sorry, Clips, Clips channel. Sorry. Damn that's it, that's mentioned. right. Yeah. Dude, we did a lot over this past week. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah, new Clips channel. Just check the link down below. Um, if, if you have Why already. Why is it called a Clips channel if we have Bytes? Because the Clips are like two to three minutes. people know that it's Clips. Yeah. yeah. Well, because Bytes is like an internal thing that we mm. use just to let it like for amongst ourselves. Mm. But um, yeah, Clips is where all the Bytes and short Clips are going to live. Got it, got yeah. it, got it. Yeah. Plus the Clips, it's pretty much like smaller snippets of like mm. stuff that, you know, it's pretty short, but it's pretty fucking impactful. Do we say stuff that's that good that we got to like take the content and then make more content out of it? We Dude. don't, but we just like to hear ourselves talk. Uh, Dude, you know what though? Like this we got is, a lot of people subscribing to this we stuff. We do, and I'm extremely Weird. grateful. But also, like when I drop a comment on like some random like video game channel, mm-hmm. I get a comment from somebody being like, "Dude, I love your guys' show." I'm like, "Holy fuck, you guys listen!" Like Why this the fuck is are fucking you weird. Listening? I love it. Why are you <laughs> it's listening? So strange to us? though. <laughs> the original Power Project when I did it years ago, I'd always say that you know if you're watching the Power Project, you're wasting your time, and if you're not <laughs> watching the Power Project, then you're wasting your time. Mm-hmm. So everybody. You know, I appreciate you wasting your time with us. <laughs> Do people, is that a catch twenty two? I don't know what the fuck a catch twenty two is, but is that a it catch sounds 22? like it? It could it's be an oxymoron. No, yeah. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. It's an algorithm. <laughs> what the fuck is a catch twenty two?